The world was red. Red as dawn. Red as blood. Red as the heart of a communist. Though some might say that the world was bleeding, others were of the opinion that it was stronger than ever. The state of the world, how it all came to this, was shaped and molded during the Cold War. It began with the war in Korea in the early 50s. Moscow had interest in the North winning the war and would see to it that both halves were united under Kim Il-sung. America, the great opposer of communism, had its own set of hardships throughout all those decades. President Kennedy was assassinated. Nixon was assassinated. Slowly the major nation crumbled, as did its population, as ideologies became ever more contradicting. As more and more factions rose through the US, fear of a new civil war grew. To avoid his country to dissolve into total chaos and destruction, Ronald Reagan dissolved the US in 1987, and each state became an independent nation with its governor at the head to rule. Though many believed this still plunged the continent into chaos, bloodshed was avoided. Throughout the years after, many states banded together to make stronger nations and factions. Though currently America was split in many different nations, there were about three that were the most prominent and likely to change the course for everyone. These were the nations along the coast, giving them far more power and possibility than those land inward. Most prominent and likely to stir up commotion was the UAPR along the west coast. This nation harbored a communist regime much in the light of the dictators back in Moscow. Angela Davis, the notorious communist revolutionary activist, stood at the reins of the UAPR. Though her looks were not as imposing as it was back during the Cold War, her spirit had been undented. Davis was a leader who would not tolerate any objection, especially since she knew that side of the spectrum well back during her activist days. To some, the closest thing that America still had to offer in comparison to the old America was the American Republic, led by Donald Rumsfeld. With the nationalists at the steering wheel, their ideals and vision on how things were were quite similar to that of the Americans of old. Love for communism and the communists at the opposite coast were non-existent. The final nation that was bound to play a bigger part in the shaping of America was the American people's commonwealth. Noam Chomsky had absolute control here. His ideology, that could be sensed as anarchist back during the Cold War, had made room for its own support of socialism as he gained support throughout the years when he gravely criticized the Vietnam War and labeled the US involvement as an act of terrorism. Though Chomsky's words could be harsh, it would come down to his actions to see where it would lead America. In Europe, the communists had almost total control. Some exceptions were Spain with its monarchy, but also the United Kingdom, the last remaining fraction of democracy in Europe, a fossil of a forgotten age. Many believed the remaining nation was like a thorn in the side of the communists, though others were of the opinion that they were too small to be considered a problem and were left alone. There were even those who believed this to be so to humiliate the British government even more. At the head of the UK stood David Owen, rather going for a liberal approach as some support could be expected from nations in America. But many other ideologies were gaining traction as well, including even communism, though some were of the opinion that this was because of spies sent from the mainland to stir up the hornet's nest and fuel communist support. Though many different opinions and ideologies were molded, the world overall was at peace. But the question was if it was a ticking time bomb, or, in the end, would unite the globe under one flag. The year of 2010 began with Britain signing a treaty to boost its own factory program. Since the collapse of European democracy, the UK's industrial sector had taken a significant hit. It was now dependent on its own ability to produce resources, something that definitely could be done but would take time and effort. Factories, mostly civilian for the moment, 
were erected throughout the entire country. Modern equipment and tools were essential to make this happen, and not to fall in the shadow of the giant known as communism. But the creation of new weaponry was also greenlit. This had to be done carefully, as not to provoke the communist nations to think that the UK was arming itself for a possible incident to come. The amount of new weapons produced was therefore kept to a minimum but steady flow. Many eyes were also fixated on Africa. With a few nations already succumbed to communism, it was but a question if this movement would also sweep the continent like it did with Asia and Europe. It was still out of the reach of the Warsaw Pact, and though communism had changed the hearts and minds of the people in Asia, the Warsaw Pact had almost no say here. Some would think that this might even lead, in the end, to a war amongst communists themselves. At the head of the Warsaw Pact, in the heart of the Soviet Union, without a doubt the most powerful nation in the entire world, stood Dmitry Yazov. He was praised for helping the country rise into power without too much bloodshed, giving the people of the Soviet Union the ability to prosper. And yet there were those who were beneath him, but would divert the nation in a whole different direction, giving the opportunity. It was but certain that the Soviet Union's stance would alter once Yazov would be gone. The debates in the Politburo resulted currently in more power and stability for Yazov himself, who knew all too well that there were those young and hungry who thought they knew better than he did. The People's Republic of China was an interesting notion as this giant behemoth adapted to communism as well, yet did not partake in the Warsaw Pact. Some believed they were now functioning as the Soviet Union's guard dog, while others believed they would eventually want dominance over Asia itself. For the moment, it focused on military expansion, and opinions differed once again if this was for their own good or for that of Yazov. Germany and France, once proud nations with a rich history and sense of honor, were now demoted as lapdogs of the Soviet Union. They would provide the Warsaw Pact with its resources with little to no return. Their actions and political programs often mirrored each other, this time with Germany focusing on political influence in the name of the Warsaw Pact, while France provided the Soviet Union with more military units and power. For Davis's nation, the current question was what to do with Las Vegas. The prospering city was once a monument of possibility and the so-called American dream. But this dream was different now. For Davis, multiple possibilities were laid on the table. She could build new casinos and make it a financial center for the entire West Coast, though its capitalist views, of course, were the exact opposite of what she stood for. It could be used as a place and object of propaganda showcasing a dwindling and ever so crumbling city, a relic of what once was and what had not succeeded. It was most likely that the city would be laid to dust, giving room and opportunity for new buildings to be erected that coerced more with Davis's vision. Other nations kept quiet. The neighboring Montana, with a fascist leadership led by Harold Covington, for now focused on economic growth. This was mostly due to the fact that with no coast at their disposal, trade was left to domestic location and logistics. The Midwest Union, with Bill Hammonds at its steering wheel, performed similar tasks, as the inner states simply needed to boost their economic power to rival that of the outer ones. The Union of Lincoln, under lead of Richard B. Spencer, did the exact same. Donald Rumsfeld, with his American Republic along the East Coast, could of course afford to leave those economic concerns to be. Its current state of America and potential threats of unrest were at the center of their debates. Whether to focus on their own inner problems or prepare for potential trouble from outside. Back in Europe, things were going quietly for Spain and its monarchy, with Juan Carlos I at its helm. Carlos was aware that the communists would rather see him leave and thus he kept his eyes and ears sharp without baring his teeth to provoke any red neighbors. Canada, part of the Democratic League and under lead of Preston Manning, was currently in the process of dealing with foreign affairs. 
it was pretty clear on what nation this was focused, since Australia was the only other nation within this democratic league. And indeed, Australia, under lead of Julia Gillard, received delegates from Canada to discuss future treaties between the two countries, both economic, political and military. And so everyone in the world seemingly kept to their own interests. Again, it was not a time of war, nor a sense of that one was coming. But there were those lying in wait, hiding in the shadows, for the opportune moment to strike and plunge the world into chaos once more.